Hey there, everybody. Good morning. It is Thursday morning, the 19th of January, and it's 930 in the morning. We're here in Jeremiah chapter number 31 today. So turn your Bibles there with me. If you are able, 40 verses this morning. I'm not sure how long we'll be here. We'll be here as long as it takes for sure. But uh, the Words are poetic in nature, and so sometimes when they are that way, we can read large sections at a time, and we'll probably do a little bit of that today. We're in a good section of the book of Jeremiah, 30, 31, 32, 33. Those four chapters provide the most positive and hopeful chapters of this entire book. It's showing Israel that God's not giving up on them, that he is still their God, that he loves them dearly. They are his children. And even though they're going through some rough times right now, they are going to be able to return to the Lord. <clears throat> so this uh, chapter actually has a quite a few nuggets in it. We're going to see the new covenant promised, the Messiah promised, even that uh, quote from Jeremiah 31, I think verse 15, about the death of the children in Bethlehem by the hand of Herod. That's in this chapter. So there's a lot of stuff in here. So let's pray and get into it and see what we've got. Father, thank you for this study and this reading that we do every day. Thank you for these books. Thank you for the way they challenge us and educate us. I pray for wisdom from our reading today. Would you help us, please? We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, Jeremiah 31. At the same time, saith the Lord. Now, at the same time, chapter, that means the same time period as chapter 30, which is latter days. So we're talking end times and so forth. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. So that's good. That's good news. That's hopeful news. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. So those who survived these terrible times, even Israel, when I went to cause him rest to rest, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. So God's love for his people is an everlasting love. And we mentioned a couple days ago that it's okay to take a scripture that contextually is intended for a very specific time period, place, purpose, people, and apply them when those same things are true in other contexts. So for instance, this is God speaking to Israel specifically before they're about to go into this 70 years of captivity due to their sin, and then he is going to bring them out of it. So that's the context of all of this. But at the same time, we are God's people, Gentiles, Jews alike, who have put faith in Christ, and uh, we belong to him. And so as his people, he loves us with an everlasting love. And so you can take these same principles and apply them appropriately and properly in different contexts. So this morning, God loves you with an everlasting love. God's love for you has no boundaries and it will have no end. <clears throat> he draws the people, it says, with loving kindness. Verse 4. Again, I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. So this is all positive news, isn't it? The whole book of Jeremiah is about destroying Israel, and here he says, I will build thee thou shalt be built. God is a builder. He builds people. He builds nations. Uh, he builds. Uh, upon this rock, I will build my church. God builds churches. So all these things are things that God is excited about and pleased about. All right, next chapter or verse number five, <clears throat> thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. The planter shall plant and shall eat them, 
as common things. And so building, planting, these are all productive endeavors. Verse 6, for there shall be a day that the watchman upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye, and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. And so a watchman was one who stood guard, and he let people know of danger that was coming or if the coast is clear. And here the watchman will cry and say, Hey, it's time to go and be with the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations, Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save thy people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, so the return from exile, the return from Babylon, and gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together, a great company shall return thither. So God will draw his people and draw them back completely to him. They shall come with weeping, and with supplications will I lead them. I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way, wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. And so God's treating his people as though he is their caretaker, their father, even that Abba father, which we would translate in English to that term of endearment, daddy. Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him, and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. So the whole world will know of the reclamation and the redemption of the nation of Israel to their God. Verse number 11, For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd, and their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. And that sounds again like Revelation 21, doesn't it? We read some verses yesterday in chapter 30 that sounded very familiar to us. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy, and will comfort them and make them rejoice in their sorrow. And I will satiate the soul of the priests with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness, saith the Lord. And so that entire section there, the first, I don't know, 30% of the chapter is going to be about God reclaiming his people, bringing them back again. He's not utterly cast them off. He's not completely thrown them out of any relationship with him. He leans to them and he calls them. He draws them in his loving kindness, as he said, and his love for them is an everlasting love. That's good news, especially based on everything we've been reading. Verse 15, now here's that that verse from the book of Matthew. Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, I'm sorry, Rachel weeping for her children refused to be comforted uh, for her children because they were not. So this is a verse that Matthew, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, used uh, to... Sorry, got a text and now I'm distracted. Used to explain the hearts of the people. So Rachel, of course, is the wife of Jacob. Uh, Her children are Benjamin and Joseph, which would give us Ephraim and Manasseh as well out of the out of the uh, lineage of, of Joseph. So Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And here in Bethlehem, the children that Herod killed two years of age and under in order to exterminate the Lord Jesus Christ, that is what he refers back to this verse to describe the feeling that the people had. You wouldn't call this prophecy. You just call it uh, a type 
typology uh, symbolically the same. Verse 16, thus saith the Lord, refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears. So Rachel's weeping, she's mourning, and God says, no more crying, that's done. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith the Lord, and they shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. And so God promises hope. Isn't that good? Man, I'm excited. I like these kind of chapters a lot better than the others. I have surely heard Ephraim bemoaning himself thus. Thou hast chastised me, and I was chastised, as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. So this is a, uh, a section on repentance now. Israel determining to get back in proper graces with the Lord. Ephraim bemoaning himself. Oh, I did some stupid things I shouldn't have. You chastised me uh, as a bullock unaccustomed to the yoke. Turn thou me and I shall be turned. You know, they've been in bondage. That yoke's been on their neck. And they're saying, please let us free. Uh, turn thou me and I shall be turned. God, turn my heart back to you and I will be turned. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. And after that I was instructed, I smote upon my thigh. I was ashamed, yea, even confounded, because I did bear the reproach of of my youth. And so Israel here lamenting, saying that they've grown and they understand now. Is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a pleasant child? For since I spake against him, I do earnestly remember him still. Therefore, my bowels are troubled for him. I will surely have mercy upon him, saith the Lord. So now the Lord speaks in return to the repentance of Israel, and he says that when they turn to him, he will turn back to them. Set thee up waymarks, make thee high heaps, set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest. Turn again, O virgin of Israel, turn again to these cities. And so the picture of a highway uh, lifted up and smooth and well marked, the way marked, signage, right? Exit here, mile marker 84. Uh, pay attention. He says, I'm making my way back uh, to me easy for you to follow. Look, salvation is easy. God has done it all. The hard part is for us understanding that God's love for us is so deep and, and massive that it's that easy. And then when you're backslidden, when your heart's not right with God, to come back to God, it's an easy road back. God always makes it easy to come back to him. Draw nigh unto me, and I'll draw nigh unto you, is what he says. And so here the highway is set up. Israel just has to get on it. Verse 22, how long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. And this is going to start getting into the, uh, the future Israel, the millennial reign, when things are just easy going and perfect here. So he says, why don't you come back to me so we can get to this. And this whole phrase, it throws a lot of folks, a woman shall compass a man. That means a woman shall uh, take care of a man or provide security for a man. And what this is simply meaning is, uh, think of Nehemiah on the wall with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. Uh, in this day, the man would just be able to have the trowel. He wouldn't need the sword uh, because the woman would even be able to watch out for him. Meaning that there's so little crime, there's so little danger, there's so little threat that the weaker sex physically can take care of and protect the man. Verse 23, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as yet they shall use this speech in the land of Judah and in the cities thereof, when I shall bring again their captivity, the Lord bless thee, O habitation of justice, the mountain of holiness. And there shall dwell in Judah itself and in all the cities thereof together, husbandmen and they that go forth with flocks. For I have satiated the weary soul and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. 
Upon this I awaked and beheld, and my sleep was sweet unto me. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down and to throw down and to destroy and to afflict, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. And so God promises to bountifully and plentifully help Israel to rebuild. And he says here, just as I've been active and watching the tearing down and destruction of Israel because of their sin, I will be as equally active in the rebuilding and replanting of Israel now that they're doing right. And then verse 29, this is a, a sort of an out of the way principle given in the next couple of verses doesn't seem really to fit. In those days, they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But every one shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. So strange little parable, I don't know it's a parable, little, little proverb perhaps, uh, saying, you know, you eat a sour grape and your teeth are set on edge. And you can understand, I don't know that it's teeth set on edge as much as it's the tartness will cause your face to wrinkle up. I don't know. But what it means here, the father's have eaten a sour grape and the children's teeth are set on edge. So this is what he's saying. The proverb was, yeah, we're suffering because of the decisions of our parents. We're having a tough time because mom and dad set up a system that hurts us. And this is one generation pointing the finger of blame at the previous generation, claiming that all of their woes are because of them. And God's saying, no, that's not what's happening here. Verse 30, everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. So he's saying, you can't blame the previous generation for your problems. And what they were saying is, Israel's going to go into uh, bondage, and that generation saying, yeah, if only our fathers had obeyed God, we wouldn't have to pay this price. And God's saying, no, you're not paying the price because your fathers didn't do right. You're paying the price because you didn't do right. Every man shall die for his own iniquity. You eat the sour grape, not your kid's teeth set on edge. You eat the sour grape, your teeth are set on edge. And so that's what these two verses are talking about. Verse 31, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So the rest of the chapter is going to talk about the new covenant that is coming. We're talking about the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 32, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this, this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So he says, the old covenant was when I led them out of Egypt by the hand, took them to Mount Sinai, and Moses came down with two tablets of testimony. My covenant before was etched in stone, but this new covenant that I'm going to make it's not going to be etched in stone. It's going to be etched in their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So this is the new covenant. And we understand that now, don't we, as New Testament age people. We know the old covenant was the Mosaic law and God gave the law to his people. And that they, they tried to live up to concerning outward conformity to the law. Then the new covenant we're not bound by that old Mosaic law anymore. However, we still actually do a better job of living up to it than those who had tried before. Because it's not just an outward law that we're expected to keep, 
It's something that God is doing in our hearts. It's a work he's doing in our hearts to bring us closer to him and for him to be our personal God and we personally are his people. And so that work that he's doing is ongoing and it will continue. Verse 34, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me. From the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Boy, this is really good stuff today, isn't it? Verse 35, Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of a moon and the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, If heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. And of course, those things cannot be done, and so he is not going to cast them off. Verse number 38, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel unto the gate of the corner, and the measuring line shall yet go forth over it against upon the hill of Gareb, and shall compass about to Goath. And the whole valley of the dead bodies and of the ashes and of the fields unto the brook of Kidron, unto the corner of the horse gate toward the east, shall be holy unto the Lord. It shall not be plucked up nor thrown down any more forever. And so, a fantastic chapter of hope and positivity for the people of Israel. About time, right? <laughs> and we've got two more chapters of this. 32 and 33 are also going to be hopeful and positive. And then 34 through the rest of the book, 52 chapters, it's going to get back to some judgment and destruction. So we're going to enjoy this while we can, won't we? Hey, all right. Thanks so much for watching today. As always, please like, love, and share the post. Let people know that we're out here. And I will see you when? Tomorrow, sometime, for chapter number 32. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.